Excellent. So it's 9.59. We will start in one minute. How are you guys doing today? Um, pretty sore. I hurt my back yesterday. Ouch. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's my normal life. It's just, you do one little thing. Yeah. And over one time. <laughs> yeah, I can relate to that. One little thing and you hurt your back. Well, I hope, uh, I hope uh, you recover quickly. Well, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, we're going to finish chapter nine today and chapter nine is ASA. And we already said we're not covering chapter 10 this quarter and chapter 10 is the GUI for ASA. And if you know how to configure ASA using a command line interface, the GUI would be straightforward. And then we have chapter 11 left, which is what we'll cover next week. And that is really a wrap. I don't think we're going to be learning any new technical stuff. Uh, it's a good chapter, but we won't be learning any new technical stuff and we'll be wrapping the course. And then week 10 is the SBA and the um, uh, final exam. So let's go ahead and do a quick review and we will review one of the labs we did. And then the focus is going to be on IPsec using ASA to tunnel to create a VPN between two sites or between a remote user uh, and a site. So we said ASA is an adaptive security appliance. We said it's a family of products from uh, Cisco. Uh, we said the beauty of the ASA is they take many of those security services and they bundle them into a single product uh, that has an advanced uh, firewall, advanced inspection uh, protection, advanced uh, anti-malware, uh, it has IPsec built into it, so you can use it for site-to-site -site or a remote user to a site VPN, etc. And we've been talking about security as a layered approach. And of course, the ASA device is not going to be able to do everything, but it's going to do its best to protect you at the border, at the perimeter. And this is where you really want to put that ASA device to provide those security services to stop bad things from coming in. And just because you're stopping bad things from coming in, it doesn't mean it's safe in the inside. And please everyone remember this. This is really important to remember is just because you're protecting the borders, it doesn't mean you know everything is great inside. So when I worked for Hewlett Packard, we had 350,000 people and I'm 100% confident not every single one of them was honest, trustworthy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you have to protect yourself from the inside as well, but of course, you know, there are 3 billion plus, 3 billion plus people out in the internet, and we want to protect ourselves from uh, the bad actors out in the internet. Okay, so they have a, a large family of ASA products that scale from home to a large enterprise. Um, if it's going to be used in line, meaning, you know, it's a router, then you want to have high availability. You want to have redundancy because it's a hardware device running an operating system. And sometimes bad things happen to hardware and, and software, and you don't want it to bring the entire network down because this is your connection to the outside. So we want to have redundancy. And of course, you want to integrate with Active Directory because Active Directory is the 800 pound gorilla in uh, network services uh, and you don't really want to have to rely on local anything you want to be able to use a uh, directory uh, accounts groups and so on and you can buy modules for uh, intrusion prevention and for advanced uh, malware if you're interested so in some cases, they are built into the enterprise products. In other cases, this is a module you have to purchase and install. And it's like a microcomputer that will offload the work to a separate module inside the ASA device. Okay. And the theory here with this slide is, uh, remember we have security levels, uh, zero through 100, and you can go from higher to lower, but you can go from lower to higher without an ACL. 
And this is what it's saying here is at a high level, we have three zones built into ASA. We have inside, we have outside, which is the internet, and we have a DMZ, which is optional. Not everyone has a DMZ, but if you want, ASA is configured with a DMZ in mind. And you can go from a higher number to a lower number by default. And if you want to go in the opposite direction, you, you can, but you will have to create an ACL. And then you will craft the ACL to allow only what should be allowed. We talked about licensing. OK, very good. And here you get to see the security levels. So you have to name your interfaces. Yes. It is E00, E01, but you also give it a name and then you use the name from that point on. And you give it a security level that ranges from zero to 100. And I already covered that before. Okay, these are two different deployment scenarios, a small business and your one and only networking device is the ASA device with the eight uh, ethernet ports in the back or for a small branch office. And if you have more than eight devices, then you can get yourself one or two switches. And then those switches will support a larger number of devices. Uh, this slide, okay, they are showing you, you can use ASA for tunneling from home. This is purely marketing, everybody. I just want you to know that this is purely marketing. Of course you can do this, but this is a several hundred dollar device. And if you have 10,000 people working from home, you don't really want to buy. You don't really need to buy an ASA device for everybody. B, people don't just work from their home. Okay, I, when I was working remotely for HP, I didn't just work from my home. I worked from everywhere. And I wanted to be able to tunnel from everywhere. So I wanted the tunneling software installed on my PC, not installed on an a ASA device. So yes, it does have its advantages, but it has lots of issues with it. And it's a great marketing slide from Cisco. I don't really think this is what's happening in the real world. A, you know, it's an expense. B, it limits you to working from home when in reality, people are working from everywhere. Uh, I had a very, very good friend when I worked from HP and he was also working from home, except he hated to work from home. And his office was at the Starbucks. I mean, he'd get up in the morning and he'd go to work, Starbucks. <laughs> and he'd be there, you know, for eight hours and then he'd come home. And he used to go to different Starbucks shops. So an ASA device isn't going to work for him because he was working remotely from different locations. Okay. And now we we'll talk about the configurations. And I'm sure you remember we said ASA is a different operating system. So it's not the familiar iOS operating system. It's similar to iOS and it's also different from iOS, but it's a different operating system. And some commands are similar and some commands are very different and we just have to uh, know the difference between iOS and ASA operating system. Okay. And we have all the familiar stuff we're used to, except there's some differences in syntax. So I'm flying over it. Okay, yes, we can SSH. Of course, we want to be able to do this. Yes, it does support NTP. Yes, it supports DHCP. And yes, it supports NAT. Okay, which is what your home wireless access point supports, right? Everybody, this is your one and only network device at home is your wireless access point. And not only does it connect to your home LAN to your ISP LAN, it has a firewall built into it. It supports NAT. It supports the HCP, right, everybody? So it has all these basic services that we all need these days. Otherwise, you would have to have a separate device to provide those services, and that would be additional complexity and additional cost for everybody. So they bundled all these services into your home wireless access point, and your home access, your wireless access point can also do intrusion prevention if you have a higher end unit, not the lower end unit. It can also do anti-malware. So they, they have some similar services to what we're seeing in ASA, except ASA is really designed for security. Your wireless access point has security features built into it, but ASA is designed for security. And it has advanced firewall, advanced inspection, advanced uh, anti-malware, not just basic, but advanced. Very good. An object. 
And I think this is where we stopped. And I want to take my time moving forward from here. And we said the big advantage of object is you build it once and you reuse it again and again. And you can embed objects in other objects. So it gives us flexibility. And this is nothing new. If you've taken any object-oriented programming class, you're familiar with it. And of course, we've worked with objects a lot in Active Directory. We said everything in Active Directory is an object, like a global group. And you can uh, deploy it to a thousand computers, but you only build it once, you maintain it once, and it functions on a thousand different computers, and you can embed groups inside other groups. And we have network objects and service objects and security objects and so on objects. But I think we all understand what an object here. And they're giving us some examples in here. This is an object group and the name is, and it's a network object, not a service object, it's a network. So we're dealing with IPs and this is the name. And then you tell, you tell that object, you know, what you wanna put in it. And let me see, these are all, and here we have a service object. So before we had a network object, and this is an example of a service object, a service like www, http, pop, ntp, and so on. And you, if you want, you can embed them inside each other. ACLs, okay, it is you know uh, advanced and it does have, it supports objects, but an ACL is an ACL. And I like to believe we've spent ample time talking about ACLs in this course and in the previous courses as well. Okay. Very good, ACLs and object groups, you can use objects in uh, ASA ACLs. Great. Uh, if you understand ACLs and you understand objects, you're fine. And they're giving us some examples here. Okay, NAT, very good, it supports NAT. Uh, the syntax is different from what we've seen before, but NAT is NAT, DHCP is DHCP, and if you understand NAT, if you understand DHCP, if you understand NTP, et cetera, then, you know, you're not going to get lost just because the syntax is slightly different. AAA, we've covered AAA in a previous class, and you can use Active Directory, which is preferable, uh, or if you don't have a directory service that ASA can integrate into, you can use AA. And it can be remote to your ASA device, like you have a separate device that provides these AA services, or it can be embedded into your ASA device. Again, if I'm saying something that doesn't make sense, please ask, but we're just putting the pieces together. So we've talked about those individual puzzle pieces, you know, DHCP, NAT, AAA objects, and now we're just putting them together. Okay, and MPF. And we already covered MPF, and we're gonna take a closer look at it today. And let me just show you. Okay, so if I was to do Cisco, because the slides don't really tell you much, okay. Modular policy framework, this is what MPF is, and this is new. We have not covered MPF in a previous course before, and it is an ASA capability. Configurations define set of rules for applying firewall features. And this is how we've used it so far. You know, we want to allow some of the traffic back in. Do you guys remember? So we can go from security level 100 inside to security level zero outside, no problem. Okay, ASA doesn't require an ACL. However, if you wanted some of the traffic back in, then you have to configure the firewall to allow some of the traffic from security area or level zero to 100. And you can do it through an ACL and I will show you that and I already showed you that before, but we'll do it again today. Or you can, do, you can use MPF uh, where we can use the inspect command and we've covered the inspect command in a previous chapter where it basically turns your firewall into a stateless sorry, a stateful firewall. So if you initiated an ICMP, the ICMP can come back in. If you initiated FTP, the FTP can come back in. If you initiated an HTTP, that can come back in. And QoS is for quality of service. 
And whenever you hear quality of service in Cisco, immediately think prioritization. So this is what we're talking about. We want to prioritize the traffic. Is this voice? Give it highest priority. Is this video? Give it second highest priority. Or is, or is this data? And give it normal priority. This is what Cisco calls it, or you know, low priority. So this is what Cisco means by QoS. And I'm sure you guys remember we covered QoS in CIS 154. So we had a whole chapter on QoS. But usually when Cisco talks about QoS, that's what Cisco is talking about. They're talking about uh, voice, video, and data. So it's a firewall feature. And we will uh, go over it again today. So first we have to create the class map and then we have to create the policy map and then we have to apply it to an interface or apply it globally. And each of these, the class map and the policy map are objects. So we can create multiple class maps and then we can embed all of them into a single policy map. And if you want, you know, we, I can show you how to do this today. So you have several different class maps and we can bundle all of them into a single policy map. And then we can apply that policy map to a particular interface or globally. All right, so let's do labs. This is the slide. I'm gonna leave this here just in case we need it. And let's do three. So we did three before, but let's redo three just to refresh your memory. And let me move this out of the way. Okay. So this is the topology we've been working with before. We only have an ASA router and ISP router. So we need to configure the ISP. The ISP is a traditional router so there's nothing new there. We just need to configure the interfaces and create a gateway of last resort. And then down to ASA, we gave it a name. We enabled a password. And then I configured VLAN 1 and VLAN 2. And I called VLAN 1 inside and I called VLAN 2 outside. And then I associated physical interfaces with these two VLANs. So for inside, it's Ethernet 0, 1, and 0, 2. And for outside, it's 0, 0. Okay. And then I created a gateway of last resort. So the ASA router is pointing to the ISP. The ISP is pointing back. And this is dangerous because we can end up playing ping pong between these two. If I was to ping 1, 1, 1, 1, and we don't have a 1, 1, 1, 1, uh, local area network, it's going to bounce back and forth until the time to live is zero. Okay. And I created an ACL. So this is an example of how you can allow some traffic back in everybody. And I'm basically saying I'm going to allow traffic from this TCP traffic from this host 8888 to this host 200.115 and only for port 80. So I'm being very, very precise, and this is good. This is an excellent skill when you're configuring a firewall. The more precise you can be, the smaller the hole in the firewall. And that's good, that's what you want. Nobody wants big holes in the firewalls that can easily be exploited. So you want them to be as small as, as possible, and this is exactly how you do it, okay? And some firewalls will allow you to add additional uh, properties like you know username has to be Zico uh, it's only open on Friday from 1 till 1 15 and that's even better this is good we can make it better by making that hole smaller and smaller okay and then we had to <clears throat> apply this ACL to an interface and we applied it to the outside because we want the outside traffic to come in so let's copy and paste So right now I'm allowing some traffic back in, but I'm not allowing inside initiated traffic back in. 
So inside traffic can go out, but it's not gonna come back in. So let's apply. And remember, when you uh, initialize an ASA device or you take it out of a box, it's gonna prompt you for a password and the password is just, you know, hit enter until you configure a password. Like now, I changed the password to Cisco123 and from, this, from now on, whenever I am prompted for a password, I have to type here, I'm gonna do exit, exit. And now it's asking for a password and it's Cisco123. Okay, and show run. And this is what we did. Not a whole lot. So we configured VLAN when and two, we gave them security levels for inside it's highest, for outside internet it's the lowest. We have a gateway of last resort that points to the ISP router and I created an ACL which I applied to the outside interface to allow these activities to happen. And now I can test it. I can go to 8888 and I can HTTP to 200.115. That is an ACL rule. So it's gonna work. Desktop HTTP 200.115. Okay, good. And if I was to HTTPS, it's gonna fail because we don't see, you know, port 443 anywhere in here that's allowed. So if I was to come back and do an S at the end of HTTP, and it's gonna time out and it's gonna fail. Okay. So if I wanted, so it failed, timed out. Now, if I was to ping from the inside, so if I was to go to server one and ping 8888, Okay. So remember, I haven't created the stateful inspection, so it's going to fail. Okay. So let's go ahead and do this. Okay. And this is the MPF. We talked about the modular policy framework and we have to create a class map or, or more than one and then decide, you know, what are we going to allow and then we're going to have to create a policy map that consists of at least one class map or more and then we have to apply it to an interface. So let's do this. And let's do it slowly. And if you have questions, please ask. So class class map, and you can name it whatever you want. So I'm gonna call it inspect because I'm lazy, I don't wanna do much typing. Okay, and now question mark, exit, no to negate or match, match, question mark. And these are my three options, everybody. I can use an access list. So if you wanna match on an access list, you can. So let's talk about the other two options. We'll come back to the access list. Any is any. So any, basically the doors are wide open. You can do anything you want. And then they created this default inspection traffic. And you can think of this as an ACL, except it's a default ACL. And then your third option is create your own ACL and be as precise as you want. So any is any. They give us a default ACL, or you can create your own ACL and do what you want. And then in here, we said, you know, match default. So I'm gonna come back and say, match default and exit. And I can create as many of these as I want. So I'm gonna do another one, class map. I'm gonna call it XYZ, and match any. Exit. And now if I was to do show run, I created two objects and here they are. Okay, class map inspect and I'm matching the default 
and class map XYZ, and I'm matching any. And I can create more if I want to do. The next thing is to do a policy map, policy map, and I'm just gonna call it global because I'm lazy. And then you have to use at least a single class. Question mark class. Okay. And I'm gonna use inspect. And if I wanted to, choose, I can I can do XYZ as well. And then what specifically do you want to inspect? So you have to be specific here. And if I was to do question mark, you can see inspect question mark. And this is what packet tracer allows us to do. This is not all of the options we have on an ASA device. We're dealing with packet tracer here and it has limited uh, capabilities. So I can do inspect ICMP, which means if I was to initiate an ICMP, it's gonna come back in. I can do an inspect DNS and I'm gonna do inspect HTTP. So no FTP, no HTTPS and exit. So run, okay, this is what I've done with the policy. And then finally, I have to apply it to an interface. It would be like creating an ACL and not applying it. It's not doing anything. You have the object, but you need to apply it. So let's go ahead and apply it. Service policy is how we apply it. And then uh, global, we called it, right, everybody? And my options are I can apply it globally or I can apply it to an interface. So I'm gonna go with global and show run. And you can see what we did. We haven't used the class map XYZ, but I can go back to the global policy map and I can add class map XYZ. So you can embed as many as you want. So remember, you know, we are allowing ICMP, HTTP, and DNS data back in. So now I'm gonna go to server one and I'm gonna ping and it's working. And if I was to do FTP, it's gonna fail because we did not allow FTP. However, we did allow DNS. So I can do NS lookup Zico and that works. I can do HTTP. 8882, but I can't do HTTPS because we didn't add that. So this is the stateful rules that we've added to our fancy advanced ACS, ASA, sorry, firewall. Make sense? So we have an ACL to allow outside traffic back in from security level zero to security level 100. It doesn't really matter if you have an ACL, it doesn't matter what the levels are, Your the ACL is gonna override that. And we used inspect to allow some internally initiated traffic back in using MPF. So if we are to look at the next lab really quick before we get to our IPsec lab. And all we're doing here is we're adding NAT and we're adding the HCP. Two very, very popular services, uh, especially the NAT part is a workaround to extend the life of uh, IPv4. DHCP is what you want on a uh, end user device. Uh, and all we've done is coming down to step four is I've enabled DHCP service and I'm dishing out IPs starting with 1.5 to 1.10 and I enabled the NAT service. So when we're leaving the ASA device, we're using NAT we are converting the private inside IP to that single public IP and backend. And then the rest of it is exactly the same. Okay. So you have the lab, you can experiment with it, but I know you're quite comfortable and familiar with NAT and DHCP. 
and the only difference is the syntax. So let's talk about lab five, which is really the focus for today. And this is IPSec. And let me refresh your memory. So, slides, IPSec. Okay. I'm sure you remember this. So we said IPSec is a framework. It's not a single uh, protocol like SSL or TLS. And we said it operates at layer three. And by now you know the advantage of that is everything is gonna have to go through layer three and everything is going to get encrypted. And if it's already encrypted once before, no big deal, we'll encrypt it again. The encryption algorithm doesn't really care. It sees a string of zeros and ones, right, everybody? And you can encrypt that string of zeros and ones as many times as you want. As long as you decrypt it in the right order, you're fine. And we do this every day. Sometimes we encrypt twice, three times, and that's fine. As long as you decrypt in the right order. So IPsec operates at layer three. It's a framework. It's a buffet, if you like. And these are the big services. So we have the IPsec protocols. Do you want to authenticate the header or do you want to encrypt the payload? So, or do you want to do both? And we know confidentiality is encryption. And encryption is only available with ESP. It's not applicable to AH. And we integrity is hashing and authentication either through a pre-shared key or a digital certificate. And DH is for that key exchange. How do we securely exchange a key between the two sides? And the bigger the DH number is, the longer that key can be. So we want a long key because longer key is safer and you would wanna use a higher DH number. So this is, think of it as version one, two, five, seven, 24. And with the newer versions, they support a longer key. They've done other refinements, but that's really the big benefit is a longer symmetric key. Is this familiar? Yes. Okay. You guys still remember it well? And you remember? I remember most of it. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I'm having a hard time with my push to talk. You're having a hard time with what, uh, Frank? The talk. The oh. push to talk button. It's not. I, I see. I see. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Your keyboard. Okay. So I'm going to leave this here just in case we need to come back to it. So let's go ahead and do that fifth lab. And before I get into this, I was playing. Everybody, I was just playing. So this is you know, X, Y, Z, this is just me playing. And I just wanted to show it to you very quickly. So it's the, the old topology we're dealing with. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to allow all initiated traffic back in, not just some initiated traffic. Remember before we allowed ICMP, we allowed uh, HTTP, we allowed uh, DNS. Well, I wanna allow everything like from home. Anything that you initiate from inside your house will come back in, your home stateful firewall. So I was saying, okay, how can I do it? And method number one is just an ACL. And this is not to turn this firewall into a stateful firewall. This is just an ACL. And I said, allow everything from 888 zero to 200110. Good everybody. And the second line doesn't belong here. Okay. And then apply it to the outside. So this will work because it's just an ACL that's saying, okay, you know, you're allowed back in. And then I said, okay, how can I do this with MPF? Okay. And I was hoping to find inspect IP, inspect all. Everybody, I was saying, okay, I don't want to do an inspect command for every protocol because there's too many. And I don't want to have to say ICMP and, you know, DNS and HTTP, HTTPS and down that long list. I just wanted uh, inspect IP 
and inspect IP will be fabulous, right? Everybody and I'm done. Or inspect any, inspect all. I couldn't find any of this. So I said, you know, how is this going to work? So I said, inspect ICMP. And remember, the match is any. Okay. And I've noticed that if I do a match any and then inspect anything, it will allow all the traffic back in. And I really believe this is a defect in packet tracer because it shouldn't work this way. Uh, but like I said, that was just me playing and I just wanted to show it to you. Is there, there, there is a way to allow everything back in and the way it works in packet tracer, but it, it's not working the way it's supposed to work. So let's do IPsec. And it's a different topology. So we have two remote sites and we want to use, and we're using ASA. This is the focus of this class, of this chapter. And we want to do an IPsec between those two sites. And before we do anything, okay, ASA. Okay. Do you guys remember those tasks? Task one, configure the ISACAM policy for IKE phase one. So create the ISACAM pipe and then create the IPsec pipe and then define the interesting traffic. We have to have some traffic going through for that pipe to be created and then create the map, apply the map. So we still have to do the same thing. So that's why I'm showing you this slide is the steps don't change because these are IPsec steps. So the difference is going to be the syntax. So some of the syntax will be different, but as long as you have your brain around this, as long as you understand those steps, you're fine. The fact that the syntax is slightly different for an ASA versus a, a traditional Cisco router shouldn't really matter much. It's the same steps. So let's go ahead and do it. Okay. So we need interesting traffic. You can do the interesting traffic in the beginning and it's going to fail until you have an IPsec configured and applied and then it will start working. Or you can do the interesting traffic at the very end. It doesn't really matter. Right? Or the only thing that matters is to know that the pipe, the VPN tunnel is not going to be established until we have some traffic going through. No traffic, they're configured properly but there is no VPN connection. So let's do the interesting traffic later on from PC1 to this PC over here. PC2, okay. So first we have to configure the basic configurations for ASA1 and ASA2. And this is what we've done before. We gave it a name, we gave it a password, we configured VLAN1. Okay, and we gave the inside a security level of 100. We configured the VLAN 2 for ASA1 because both of them are connected to the internet. <clears throat> and we gave it a security level of zero. And uh, I created a gateway of last resort. And then let's look at this ACL, everybody. Now we're becoming more comfortable with the ACL. So let me make this a little bigger. Okay, and let me make sure you understand what this ACL is saying. So access list ACL in is just the name, extended permit IP, okay, very good. And now I'm saying 192.168. 192.168 is the other local area network on the other end, okay? And you can tweak this any way you want, but I'm saying allow everything from 192.168.2, and this is this local area network back in. Remember, the inside security level is 100 for ASA 1 and 2, and the outside is 0. We don't really need an ACL to allow the traffic out because we're going from security level 100 to security level 0. No big deal. However, we need an ACL to allow the traffic in. And this is what this ACL is. It's to allow the traffic in from the other local area network 192.168.2. 
or local area networks. In this example, it's just two local area networks. And then the same thing for, you know, the interfaces that connect to the outside. I want to be able to ping, you know, the other ASA, and I want to allow that ping to come back in, so I create an ACL for it. So the first ACL is to allow all the traffic from 192.168.20 in, and the next, is, the second ACE is to just allow the ping from the other ASA device to come back in. Okay, and I applied it to the outside because I want to allow it in. So let me copy and paste. And then it's very similar configuration for ASA2. Except we turn the uh, local area networks around. So from ASA2 point of view, I have to allow 192.168.10 traffic in. And this is what you will see in here. And I also want to allow the ping uh, traffic to come back in when I am pinging uh, ACA1. The same exact configuration just from the other side. So let's see what we did. Okay, fast forward a little bit. And now from ACA1, I can ping ET00 and ACA2. And it's gonna work because I'm going from 100 to zero and then I have an ACL that allows it back in. So I'm gonna ping 13.1.1.1 and it's gonna fail the first couple of times and it should work. Very good. Everybody, you see that? So I'm pinging this interface right here. So this is 13111. This is 13112. And if I was to ping that, it's going to fail because I didn't allow the traffic from 112 back in. I only allowed the traffic from 13111. So again, a very, very precise ACE that only allows those two IPs to talk to each other. And it's going to fail. And it failed. So let's move down to the IP stack. So we don't, so we've just done the basic configurations, nothing fancy. And PC1 still can talk to PC2 because we don't have a tunnel. We don't have a tunnel. We're going through the internet. ACA1 is connected to the internet. ACA2 is connected to the internet, but we don't have a tunnel between the two. And if you don't believe me, let's ping PC2. 192.168.22 and it should fail because they don't know about each other yet until we have that tunnel that connects the two. Right now they're disjointed and the tunnel is going to connect those two local area networks to one another. Again, you have a home local area network, you have an office local area network, you're not gonna be able to ping anything inside your office until you have that pipe between your home PC, your home ASA, and the office ASA. So crypto, okay, the syntax is different, everybody, but don't let that bother you. So you create a template, you put all the commands in the template, and that's where you go when you need to configure something. And don't worry about the syntax. Just make sure you understand those six steps we talked about before. So I know you remember the policy, right, everybody? And we said the policy is an internal, internal to the device. So it can be 10, 15, 20, call it what you want. Okay. Encryption AS256. Now it's beginning to look familiar, I hope. Okay. Hashing SHA. And I was lazy. I didn't spell out encryption but you could authentication a pre-share lifetime remember you know how often do you want to renegotiate those keys and this is 24 hours this is the biggest number you can put in you can put a bigger number than 24 hours group five we're talking the edge 
And the reason why I didn't put an awful lot of descriptions here is because we've done this before. So I'm assuming you remember. If not, we can go back to the previous chapter and you can look at the labs with more description. So this is basically the policy for the ISA camp. So uh, IKE phase one, we create the ISA camp pipe and these are the properties. These are the parameters for the ISA camp pipe. And then inside we create an IPsec pipe and we need a different properties, a different parameters for that and different keys. So we have one set of keys for the ISA camp and we have a different set of keys for IPsec. And this is all to make sure we have a secure connection and we want to renegotiate those keys on a regular basis so they don't, we don't give the bad actors time to, to figure out what they are. Okay. Phase two, I know you remember this everybody and we're saying ESP these are the parameters for IPsec. So we're using, we're um, encrypting the payload. This is what ESP is. And we're using AES-256 and we're using ESP-SHA. This is HMAC. I know you still remember that hashing message authentication code. So we are encrypting and we're authenticating. ESP AES-256 is encryption, ESP SHA HMAC is for the authentication to make sure, yep, it really did come from ASA2 or from ASA1 and not any other device. This is the authentication piece. So two pipes, one inside each other, and they each have their own parameters and they each have their own keys. Okay. And then we need an ACL that says, this is what I'm going to allow inside that tunnel. This is a IPsec ACL that says, okay, now I have a tunnel. What kind of a traffic am I gonna allow in? Okay. And you've seen all of this stuff before. This is the peer IP. This is the lifetime for the IPsec in seconds. Okay. And then, we apply it and this is the pre-shared key. Okay, this is the password um, because that's what we agreed we're going to be using a PSK, a pre-shared key. And this is it. And the syntax is different, but that's about it. That's the only difference from what we did last week. And in fact, I wanna show you if you don't mind. Let me go back to week eight. And let me do site to site. And you will see the syntax is different. Okay. Policy 10, policy 10. Okay, crypto ICAV. Okay, policy 10. Crypto IC, ISA camp. Okay, who cares? And then encryption, encryption, hash hash, authentication, authentication, uh, group five, group five, pre-share, pre pre-share, lifetime, lifetime. Same exact parameters. And the order doesn't matter. You can put them in whatever order you want. Okay. And then if we were to come down to the IPsec portion, I'm gonna make this a little bigger. And here it is right here everybody and look what this is telling us up here okay we're only using esp ipsec protocol packet tracer doesn't support uh, authenticating header so we couldn't do that uh, but we can encrypt very good and over here we're doing both over here we are in chapter eight uh, packet tracer allowed us to use uh, authenticating header and then we're encrypting the payload and then we are authenticating where the payload came from. So we're authenticating twice. We're authenticating the header and we're authenticating the payload. We're encrypting the payload. Over here, we're not authenticating the header, but the rest of it is the same. It's exactly the same. 
So the syntax is different, but that's it. That is the only difference. So let's copy and paste. This is ASA1. And then the configurations are exactly the same. Uh, from the other side, we just change the IP addresses. The rest of it is the same. And they have to be the same. And if they're not the same, then you're asking for trouble, right, everybody? So we have to negotiate an agreement between those two devices. And the parameter is better be the same, or you're going to have a problem. Uh, and in some cases, they don't have to be the same. Uh, but then you're creating more work for yourself. For example, the lifetime doesn't have to be the same. It's five minutes over here. It's one minute over here. Well, guess what? You know, you're going to renegotiate the keys every one minute because one of the two sides saying, yep, hey, buddy, it's time we renegotiate the keys. And you're going to renegotiate the keys. Uh, but in theory, you want them to be the same. And it's really easy to do. You just copy and paste, and you change the IPs, and you're done. And let's do it on ASA2. And this is all the configuration. So we have the encrypted password. We configured VLAN 1 and VLAN 2. We gave them security levels gateway of last resort. These are the ACLs we created. Two of them were to allow some traffic back in, and one of them was specifically IPsec, and it says IPsec ACL. And these are the parameters we configured for phase one, phase two, for ISACAMP and for IPsec. And right now, if I was to do show crypto uh, ISACAM security association, there is nothing. And if I was to do IPsec, there's nothing because we don't have any interesting data going across. So let's create those tunnels. So I'm going to come to PC1 and I'm going to ping PC2. And it's going to fail a few times until ISACAMP uh, pipe is created, until the IPsec pipe is created, and then traffic will start flowing. Actually, that's quite impressive. That's quite fast. OK. And because we said allow IP, everybody, remember that in the ACL, so we should be able to do anything we want. So we should be able to. FTP 192.168.24. OK, we should be able to do an S lookup. We, there's no limit because we said permit IP. I should be able to do HTTP and HTTPS 192.168.24. And I should be able to go back the other way, no restrictions. HTTPS 192.168.13 and works. So there's no limit because in here, I want to show you everybody. So run. The ISP said IP. Permit IP anything from this LAN to anything inside the other LAN and back. So we didn't put any traffic restrictions on the IPsec or on the router ACL. And now if I was to do show crypto ISACAMP security association, yes, it's there. OK, that's all I can do in here. And if I was to do IP security association, you can see traffic is flowing back and forth. Do I have any other options here? Nope. So it limits my options. 
there should be more options in a real product there will be more options under isacamp and under ipsec but asa limits our options to the security association and asa is a super popular device i have said this before it's used widely by lots and lots and lots of different companies small medium and large and they use it for all the things we talked about in chapter nine including remote access which is huge right now right everybody i mean it's always been huge but it's even bigger right now with COVID 19 and lots of people are working from home and they need to ipsec into their business and people that already have asa devices can use those devices to enable that to happen to allow people access into their enterprise and we've said you probably don't want to buy an asa device for everybody it's expensive and uh, it doesn't take care of all the scenarios it only takes care of that one scenario when you are working from home uh, but if you're a remote user you're not just working from home Any questions on ASA? Anything no, no. you would like to see? I interrupted you, Frank. Uh, no, no. Okay. So when we did the IPsec for ASA, did it flow quickly or were you having some difficulties with it? It's the same exact process. IPsec is IPsec. Here it is. What happened to it? Is it this? Oh yeah. Okay. IPsec is IPsec. So the only difference you will see between a traditional Cisco device, an ASA device, a Hewlett Packard uh, router, a uh, Palo Alto network, security device or a router is the syntax okay the the framework is exactly the same and it works exactly the same on all devices the only difference is the syntax so every ios will have a slightly different language different commands and if you understand the process it's really easy to map in your head yep this is the isec camp stuff yep this is the ipsec stuff uh, and if you do it a few times, which I know you will, because IPsec is king. IPsec is huge, massive. This is the protocol almost everybody is using these days to connect remote sites to one another and remote users and suppliers, contractors, you name it. If you have a need to connect with a branch or a company, or a different business this is the the gold standard right now is ipsec and will continue to be because it's a framework and like i said before we can add and we can remove remove i'm, I'm not sure we will remove for backward compatibility reasons i mean look dh1 is still there and now we're up to dh24 and version one is still out there for backward compatibility. Someone out there may be using the H1 and they don't want to break it, but they can certainly add. That's easy enough to do. So become comfortable with IPsec. That's what I'm saying, become comfortable with it. Not so much the syntax, just become comfortable with the steps. Here, I want to show you. Become comfortable with this. Task one, configure ISAC CAM. Task two, configure IPsec. Task three, the ACL that defines the interesting traffic for that IPsec pipe. You need an ACL for the pipe that is separate from the router ACL. This is just for the pipe, what's flowing inside that pipe. You need an ACL, okay? And then you need a map, and then you need to map it to an interface and you test it.
Questions? We're good? I believe so. Okay, so let's talk about next week. So we have one chapter left. I don't think I have any packet tracer labs for it. Uh, it talks about the importance of security policies. It talks about some tools. Some of you are probably familiar with some of those tools. Some of you may not be familiar with the tools, uh, but it's, it's just a wrapper. It's just a wrapper. And I don't think there's any new technical stuff. We're not gonna be talking about any new technical stuff. Just wrap this, this course together and talk about some interesting stuff. And I don't know if we're gonna need both days or one day, so we will get together in Tuesday and we'll start from the beginning and we'll see how it goes. And if we finish on Tuesday, great. If not, we will finish on Thursday. Uh, but that's all I have for today. If you have questions, if there's something you would like to see, I would love to show it to you. Otherwise, we're done. Going once, twice. Have a great weekend, everybody. We'll see you next week. Do these labs. Have a good weekend, Zico. Thank you. And Bye. go over the Net Academy material, which I know you will. Have a good one, Zico. Thank you, Joey. You got what you needed, Joey? Yeah, I'm going through and I'm uh, gonna